listening to Second Wind with Joyce Buford, where women who are ready to expand their life adventure discover the tools to stop playing small and tap into the courage required to enjoy their Second Wind. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Second Wind. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. This is where I like to share with people about getting their second wind. And I'm our guest today is a lady that has absolutely taken that and, and magnified it <laughs> three, four, five, six times. So I'm excited to share with you my guest, Toby Dore. Now, Toby calls herself um, a prison volunteer, an inmate, a female true crime writer that because of that short stay in prison, she was able to totally change her life. Now, Toby is amazing when she goes over all this information, but it's, it's the gift that she found while she was in prison. So Toby, I know my, my listeners are going, what, 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 you talk, what? <laughs> we've never listened to a person that's been in jail before. Not that yes. they told us, Maybe uh. they would. <laughs> so, we never know, but anyway, it's just, I'm just in awe of what you've been able to create Toby. So welcome and tell us, we're so anxious to hear your story. <laughs> Thank you so much. So in 2004, I decided I needed to do something to make a difference in the world. And I started a prison dog program. And yeah. that was making a difference in the world. It was amazing uh, the impact it had in our community and in the prison. Mm -hmm. But I fell in love with one of my dog handlers. And I was at a really crossroads point in my life. My dad was dying. Uh, my sons had left home. I kind of realized that I was living with a stranger because my husband and I had grown so far apart and without yeah. the boys in the house, there was nothing to connect us. And yeah. it just kind of was this perfect storm. And when the man I fell in love with suggested that maybe I would be with him when I, he got out of prison, at first I thought he meant, you know, like when he got out the right way, but yeah. um, it, it soon morphed into an escape plan, which worked to my surprise. And I smuggled him out of the prison in my d prison dog van, and he was hidden inside of a dog crate. And I was going to a dog adoption. Oh. We were on the run for 12 days. Oh, and no, Bonnie and Clyde. Yes, <laughs> it's exactly right. That's what it felt like. And surely at the end it was too, because uh, we were spotted on an interstate in Tennessee and they set up a trap. And we ended up in a high-speed car chase and crashed into a tree at 100 miles an hour. <gasps> and if that doesn't shake your world, yeah, uh, it definitely gets shaken when they pull you out of the car and handcuff you and take you off to jail. So, right. you know, I was at a point where my life was going to change and there was nothing I could do to stop it. So I just kind of had to go along with it. Right. Well, how do you even get to be a a as you were a volunteer, mm -hmm. how did you get the confidence of the prison system to allow you to come in to do that? I mean, uh, most people wouldn't even think of doing that. You know, um, I had a cancer diagnosis and some cancer surgery. And while I was recovering, I realized that I really hadn't done anything to make the world a better place. And my oh, time could be yes. up. So I needed yes. to do something to leave a mark on the world and make the world a better place. Whoops, that was my, I need to turn that off. Um, <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. No worries. So I, um, I realized I needed to do something to make a mark in the world and, and leave the world a better place. Yeah. And I decided to start a dog rescue group. I'd always been involved in rescue and I worked part-time at a vet clinic. Oh. And then someone from the prison approached me and asked, uh -huh. Would I be interested in starting a prison dog program, which yeah. really was something I'd been dreaming of because I'd seen it on TV, but mm -hmm. I didn't know it was real. Mm -hmm. And so I just jumped at the chance. And uh, in the 18 months I ran the program, I, I started the program with seven dogs. And 18 months later, I had brought a thousand dogs into the prison dog program. 
Oh my God. I mean, it was That's the biggest amazing. prison dog program in the country. Yes. And every dog I took was a dog that was on its last chance, you know, it was going to be oh, euthanized in a shelter yes. somewhere. So oh. I was given these dogs new life. But the real surprising thing was the way it changed the prison, because you can imagine we're social creatures. Mm -hmm. We thrive in a community. We yearn for community. And in a prison, you don't have that. It's dangerous to have that. You don't oh. confide in anyone, you yes. know, and unless you're lucky enough to have this, you don't even get to hug anyone. And oh. so when I bring these dogs into this environment and all of a sudden these men have something they can pet and love and sleep with and tell their troubles to the whole atmosphere of the prison softened even yes, for those yes. who weren't in the, a dog yeah. handler yeah so it was making a difference and i was pretty proud of that um yeah. you know it helping somebody escape from prison was really not a good idea but at that moment in time it felt like it's what i needed to do to shake up my life Hindsight is just amazing. It, it is, isn't it? At the time we feel it. And I can just see this woman that was so desperate for love, as you have yes. said, having that given to her on just mm -hmm. here, I'm here. I can see, I can see how easy that would have mm -hmm. been. I mean, your heart would have gone out. But I, I'm pretty crazy about dogs too. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I totally get the dog and how it can soften any heart. Yes. Really. Or dog, mm -hmm. cat, whatever your preference Yes. Is. But I'm a dog yeah. girl. So. I, I've always been, you know, my nickname at the prison was the dog lady. And a lot of people <laughs> still call me that. And that's cool. I'm fine with that. Yeah. But I've learned that I'm also a cat woman because I have a cat now and I just love my oh. cat. So yes. two perfectly different temperaments. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yes. Yes. So you, you're continued today to even do your dog work at the prison? No, no, I don't. No, you, I, <laughs> they I wouldn't let me back in. Had got, oh, they, <laughs> yeah, no, they wouldn't let me you back in. You burned that bridge. <laughs> I mean, the one thing my husband and I do do now is uh, we are rescue transport drivers. So there's animals that they need to move across the country. Yes. And we yeah. take an hour or two hour leg of journeys and help move dogs, cats, rabbits, turtles whatever oh, right. needs to move to another rescue group to get adopted. And we drive legs of those rescue transports, yeah. but that's a, the extent of my involvement in rescue today. Yeah. So when you went to trial and were given the um, sentence, which was 27 months, 27 months. That's right. What, what was going through your mind? I mean, you know, I, I told my attorney, there is no way I can do 27 months in prison. There is no way. And he said, yes, you can. It'll go fast. And I was like, nothing goes fast in prison. I mean, it's yes. like time just crawls. But, you know, I had no choice. So I decided after a few days in jail, I realized, you know what? I think I can do this. And, and I think I can learn from this because for the first time in my life, I didn't have any deadlines. I didn't have any meetings. I didn't have any responsibilities. So yes. I was free. I was completely mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. And to me, it felt like I had escaped prison by going to prison because now yes. I had all this time and I could use that time to just focus on my life, focus on myself, focus on how I was feeling, focus on where I wanted to go in life and develop a plan for how to get there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, add, this is a very naive question, but I, you know, from all the movies and we, mm -hmm. we must learn not to trust movies <laughs> because they really do doctor it up. <laughs> I have stories about that, but um, they sort of portray going into prison as being you're afraid of, you know, the systems that are in there that the workers create mm -hmm. to protect and they have groups and they have so did you find that in, is that, you know, really in prison? It, it is true. There are groups in prison. And so for instance, in one prison I was in, 
there was a woman who owned the TV. Now the TV is in the day room and, and nobody owns the TV, but these inmates gave her the authority to own the TV. So you couldn't change a channel, even if she wasn't watching, unless you went and asked her, you know, oh. so I just avoided all that. I didn't get caught up in any of that drama. Yeah. Um, and, and I do believe the men's prisons are the, 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 Call the what do you want to call them? I don't want to call them gangs because I don't mean gang in the real sense, but the group of people you hang out with mm -hmm. are much more influential and much more powerful in the men's prison than they are in the women's prison. Women's prisons, the women just, you know, they just don't have the same violent tendencies that the men have. So oh, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. But still, 27 months seem, can yes. seem huge. As it, you look at it on the first day. Yes, life. it does. I mean, when I first went to jail and they told me I was going to have to be in jail for two weeks until we went to court, I had a meltdown. I said, there is no way I can spend two weeks in here. Mm -hmm. Well, I did. And then I spent five months and then I spent, you know, and eventually it was 27 months and you just get through what it is you have to get through because really you don't have another choice. Right. Yeah. So do you usually have a roommate? in your cell? Uh, yes so it just depended I was in five different facilities and every one was different but one of the facilities I was in there were rooms that were built for four people and they were so overcrowded that there were eight people <gasps> in a room oh my and that was you know that kind of escalated the tension and the oh, arguments yeah. and the drama uh one prison I was in, I, I was in a room by myself. And then another time I was in a room with one other roommate. So those are kind of the instances I experienced. Why were you in five? I mean, what was the reason they you were know, with you? So first you go to jail and you're in a jail while you go through your court process. And once you're mm -hmm. sentenced, you go to prison. So I went to the state prison and then I, the federal government uh, indicted me for some federal charges. So then I had to go oh. back into the federal system. And then when I, and then when I finished court in the federal system, I had to go back to the state system to finish the state time. And then when I finished the state time, I had to go into the federal prison to finish my federal time. So oh. it was 27 months total, but I moved yeah. six times. So wow. it was, yeah. yeah. But while you were in there, I love this since completing her time in federal prison, she has achieved two master's degrees. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and rebuilt a broken life. So yes. let's start talking about that because that's where I think the meat okay. is. Okay. Yes, it sure. really is. Yeah. So, you know, I realized when I was in prison that there were a lot of things in my life that I, you know, old grief and wounds and trauma that I had never dealt with. Yeah. And so I needed to bring all that to the surface and confront it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of felt like it was digging in and peeling off scabs of things I thought had healed and, and let them bleed again and oh, heal yeah. properly. So yeah. uh, it required a lot of that really hard work. And then did you do this with help from a psychiatrist or was there anything like that available? No, no, I didn't. So um, how did you do that? I just decided I was going to do it myself. And I was just going to, I started writing and actually I wrote, I filled 27 journals while I was in prison. And I really found that writing was a key to getting inside and figuring out all this stuff. You're right. Writing is so powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know I've, I've even coached and I had to have a friend tell me, you need to write Joyce when I was going yes. through a lot of grief. Uh -huh. And I went, duh, Joyce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so you always need that that support. That, that's right. And I, I find that writing with a pen on paper touches a different part of your brain than sitting at a computer and typing it. So wow. I like to write it by hand and then go to the computer and, you know, flesh it out there. Mm -hmm. But I think writing it by hand just really gets into the meat of who you are right inside. I think yeah. your hands connected to your heart somehow. And as you write, you know, the stuff comes out that you would never type when you were thinking with your head while you were typing. Yeah. So. Well, it kind of goes back to the childhood uh, uh, activity of the diary, you know, yes. starting yes, back in our does. childhood, mm -hmm. but I didn't do it. 
I think I bought a diary, but I never opened it. You know, I, I yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. You know, I wanted the pretty diary with the right color cover and the little lock and the key. And I thought that was so special, but then I never wrote in it because I didn't want to mess up the pages, you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> but it's okay it to mess up the pages, you know? Yeah. Yes. So I, you talk in, in your book and we are here to talk about your book. Mm -hmm. So the name of your book is living with conviction and it is uh it, it's all about the sisterhood i found in prison and the path of healing and redemption uh, so it's it starts actually from the moment i get arrested is the beginning point of the book and a lot of people oh. thought when i wrote a book they that i should write about the escape but my book coach and my editor you know they said no the real story of toby happened after the arrest it happened the moment you got arrested and and then mm -hmm. you had to become who you are. So mm -hmm. that's what the book is about. Mm -hmm. when, but you do talk about slaying the shame dragon. Oh, that shame dragon. Talk about shame. Uh, it's big, it's in all of us. And um, that shame big. dragon, you know, I pictured my shame dragon as, as a dragon. And it's this scaly green, muddy green color with teeth that are daggers and this terrible breath and he just slobbers and he slams his tail and knocks me down and I have to get up and fight him back and and I you know I let myself believe I've slain that shame dragon but then somebody posts something on my Facebook page about what a terrible person I am for trying to tell a story about being a criminal and and guess Not what that one. there's the shame dragon again he's right back you know and I realize that I can never slay him forever. I can just slay him in the moment. So I have to continue oh, that's this good. battle. I have to always yes. have my guard up and watch out for him to rear his head. So give us your definition of shame. Uh, shame is when someone, I believe, and then it carries over and you feel the same way. Someone tries to hold you in that worst decision you've ever made and never lets you be redeemable. There's nothing you can do to redeem yourself from whatever poor decision you made. And there are people who want to hold you in that place. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, in fact, my sisters try to hold me in that place. Yeah. And I've had to, you know, realize that that relationship is probably never going to be what it was before and mm -hmm. it's a new relationship and I just have to kind of keep them at arm's length because I can't let other people bring me down mm -hmm. it's it's too you know I think our psyche even when we feel strong and confident and we've overcome a lot of things there's still a fragility there and mm -hmm. it you know, someone can knock you down and you got to start all over and build yourself back up. So I try to kind of keep that at arm's length so that I don't get close enough for someone to knock me all the way down again. Yeah, but it's, it is a people outside of ourselves that do it. Mm -hmm. But I many times think it's the demon inside of us that we have. There is one in there too. So yes, yes. That's the so, one that keeps mm -hmm. reminding us of the things we don't want to hear as well. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. You know, and there's, I have this, I have this shame dragon demon inside me when someone points out, well, you're a criminal. What are you doing? And I think I should just go stand in the corner. You know, I'm a bad girl. And it's like, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm so much more than that thing they're stuck on. You know, I've helped a lot of women get, regain custody of their children after they got out of prison and, and other things, you know, encourage them to go to college and tutor them and help them and, and help them change their lives. And those things matter yes. just as much, if not more than the one thing I did to get myself into prison. Yeah. Well, you can always think about those two masters. Those aren't easy to get. <laughs> No, they're not. They're not. But I love going to school. So I just decided that's what I was going to do. And, and I did get two master's degrees after I got out of prison. What were those master's degrees? One of what them was area? a master of science in internet marketing. Okay. One of them was a MFA in media design. So digitally creating things, which is what I've used in my workbooks. I've created a series of workbooks for women 
to help them rebuild their lives. And I designed the workbooks myself and, you know, the, the covers and all the graphics and uh, all the content. So that's how I put those degrees to work. Yes. Well, I hear some creativity in there. I didn't see that in your description. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am very creative. In fact, I just this weekend created a card deck that I'm going to uh, put into my list of products. So oh, it's good. a, you know, an inspirational card deck that women can draw a card and get an inspirational thought for the day. So that'll right. be out there within the next month or two, I think. So, right. Well, your book is coming out this month, correct? It is out. It came out June 15th. Oh, it came out so, ahead of what's on. <laughs> yeah. So there's a paperback version, uh -huh. an ebook version, an audio book and a hardcover. Do you do the audio? Did you? I did. I read the audio book myself. I am so, so impressed with people who do their <laughs> own audio. Yes. Book. You know, I just love it because when the author reads her own work, you get the emotion and you get the feeling and you get the drama in the story instead of just a narrator reading it. Yes. I'm listening to another audio book right now that the author wrote and oh my gosh, you know, it just excites me when you can hear the quiver in her voice or the anger in oh. her voice. You know, it just brings so much more to the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great to read. Well, we mm -hmm. talked several times about freedom behind bars. And I immediately, when I think of being in prison or uh, confined to my room, I lose freedom. And mm -hmm. so you talk about freedom behind the bars. Yes. Tell me so, about that freedom. Uh, so here's what I have learned. We all have prisons. I had a mm -hmm. huge prison before I went to prison. So my message to women is to escape their prisons. Now, if you are in a physical prison, you have to escape spiritually. You have yes. to get inside of yourself and find an escape, find a way to get through it. If you're in a spiritual prison out here in the real world, then I think you need to change something in your physical environment and go out and do something different, go somewhere different, move somewhere different. You mm -hmm. need to change your physical place in order to break out of your spiritual prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of the prisons that would, well, let's just say that women grow up with, tell us some of those. Prisons. So, um, you know, You've already a lot got of the, the shame. That's one. Yes. You got okay. the shame. So, um, when I was five years old, my dad was burned really bad in an accident in our backyard and he was gone to the hospital for eight or nine months, a long time. Oh, and I, I was the oldest of five and mm -hmm. I was five years old. And I felt like I had to step in and become a parent to my younger brothers yes. and sisters. So I right. changed their diapers and fixed their lunches and tried to care for them because At my parents were gone. Old. Yes. And so that created in me this prison of duty, duty, duty. You must always work. You must always help others. You can't, you can't focus on yourself. You can't play. There's no time for play. Yeah. That's the prison that I created in my life. But I've seen mm -hmm. women uh, create prisons of believing that their self-worth is only found through a, a partner. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, they, they, and then those. when you choose a partner that doesn't treat you well, then that just brings you so far down. And really what the lesson is, is that you have to be you have to love yourself. You have to fix yourself. You have to be there for yourself. And then if you find someone else to accompany on your journey, that's great. But you can't let that person be the center of your world. You have to remain the center of your own world mm -hmm. in order to be of any use to the rest of the world or to the people around you. You have to make sure that you're healthy, emotionally healthy. Um, I've worked with women whose uh, prisons have been drugs or alcohol yeah. or uh, food. poverty. Food. Yes, food. Yeah, food is a big one. Poverty, you know, they just don't see a way to get out of their present circumstance. So they just give up and accept that there's no hope for them. And that's the prison that they're mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I like, I sing in a church choir and mm -hmm. I love to sing in a church choir. Mm -hmm. um, I love to sing. But 
I've, I hear so many times people say, oh, I'd love to sing in the choir, but you know, I just don't want, my husband doesn't like to sit by himself in the church. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, give me a break. Mm -hmm. He's an adult. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> For right. Your joy, don't give it away. That's you know, right. Really Those are the simple, subtle things that women do mm -hmm. for their mate as if they're leaving they leave they can't separate themselves from the relationship and I'm not speaking against relationships at all but in a relationship I think you have to have growth and appreciation for each other's talents so they can grow those talents you do and I think women have this you know we care we're we're compassionate we're empathetic right. i mean we're we're governed by love and we don't extend that same love and compassion and empathy to ourselves because we mm -hmm. think our job is to take care of others well really our job is to take care of ourselves and then taking care of others will just fall into place and it'll be so much healthier mm -hmm. yeah and have those um conversations i in my own marriage which i I'm divorced. Mm -hmm. um, we just didn't know how to have a, a grown up conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> very true. Thing. Yeah. So saying something about the need to sit in a choir loft mm -hmm. or go out with girlfriends one night a week or to do whatever it is mm -hmm. that you want to do, then that's that's a skill that I think a lot of marriages need to build. I agree. Yeah. In my first marriage, my husband discouraged me from having any girlfriends and going out and doing anything with girlfriends and mm -hmm. that was a wound I mean that, there's something that you lose in that and today I have some girlfriends I'm really close to and they're such a blessing in my life because they can lift me up in mm -hmm. a way that my husband can't because yeah. he's not a woman so right. I, I think I think having a balanced life that has a lot of elements in it is critical. You yeah. can't just focus on one person in your life yeah. because that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You talk about the victor, mm -hmm. victim, the victim. Yes, the victim or the victor. <laughs> so, you know, when I got arrested and the whole time I was going through the court system and my really my whole time in prison and even still today, there are a lot of people out there who want me to say that I was a victim of the man I fell in love with, that he manipulated me and, and talked me into helping him escape and that I was his victim. I realized early on that if I got stuck as a victim, first of all, being a victim takes away all responsibility for me. And mm -hmm. I said, yes, right. I could have said no, but I said, yes. So it was important to me to stand up and not wear that mantle of victimhood because right. I felt if I put it on, I would be a victim for the rest of my life. And that's not where I wanted to be. So instead I stood up and said, no, he didn't manipulate me. I made a choice. It may not have been the best choice, but it's mm -hmm. the choice that I made at the time. And I'm going to live with the consequences of that choice. Yeah. The thing about the victim is it doesn't stay in the area where you are the victim. It that's seeps right. seeps over into your other areas. Yes, that's right. And then you are the victim. because, And you can never overcome that, that original thing that you thought made you a victim. You can't overcome it until you quit calling yourself a victim. Right, yeah. What do you think? There must be a perk people get from saying I'm a victim. I think that... I think that then they can say, you know, poor pitiful me, don't be mad at me. I couldn't control what I did. So, you know, it takes them off the hook of yes. people saying, look what you did. But at the same time, it puts you in this even worse place where now you're to be pitied. And yeah. who wants to spend their life being pitied? Oh, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. No, no, that won't work. Yeah. You have a statement that you you repeat a couple of times and I love this statement. It's mm -hmm. so powerful. None of us is our worst mistake. That's right. You know, I'm going to be 65 years old here in a couple of months. 
I believe there's a million things I've done in my life. And mm -hmm. I did one thing that made international news. Mm -hmm. That cannot be who I am. It's a yeah. part of who I am, but it is not the one thing that I am. There's so much more to all of us than the one thing that we did wrong. And if the whole world forever wants to keep us as that one bad mistake we made, well then, in my opinion, the world loses because mm -hmm. there's a lot of good that can come out of redemption and rebuilding your life and sharing your stories with other people. Mm -hmm. And if someone tries to keep you into that worst mistake, then the world loses out on all that education and all that experience and all that grace. Yes. And it, it, it kind of just snips the creativity out of you. you it certainly does. Be creative if you're carrying a heavy burden like that's right that burden just that's will that. crush you yeah i've gotten pretty good about laughing because i seem to make <laughs> small mistakes all the time i think laughter is a great medicine <laughs> yes. yes there are things like going out with the girls that you can laugh and laugh and laugh mm -hmm. and we yes. don't laugh the same men and women don't laugh at the no same they don't things. they don't <laughs> You know, my husband and my husband is awesome. We have these deep, profound conversations, which I just crave. Yes. But there's some things he just can't get. Like, what, what is it about this plant that makes you so happy? It's just a plant. I mean, you know, there's just a difference. And, and I just accept that and right. um, share those things with my girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Now, the program that you created, tell us a little bit about that. Is so, it for anybody or, or somebody that anybody it is, has? It is for anybody. Book? So my program is called the Unleashed Series. The uh -huh. first workbook is called Butterflies Unleashed, and it's uh -huh. all about transformation and personal development. When I first wrote that workbook, I envisioned it being for women in prison, you know, helping them, you know, learn discernment and boundaries and vision and gratitude and faith and purpose, all these characteristics that we need to be able to overcome where we are in our life. Yeah. But I've had a lot of women buy that workbook who aren't in prison and have gotten a tremendous amount out of it because I really think, you know, it deals with all of us breaking out of our prisons, whether they're mm -hmm. ones that we've created or physical prisons. And it's a prison of our mind and our emotions. So that's the yeah. first workbook. The mm -hmm. second workbook is called Be Unleashed. And it's a story of community because we are only as good as the company we keep. And Amen. a lot of women, yes, a lot of women who get into trouble, it's because of who they've associated themselves with. Yes. So this Be Unleashed book is all about how to find a healthy community and how to thrive in that community and how to be a part of a community that gives to others as well as learning how to receive with grace because mm -hmm. community is about giving and receiving and and a lot of women don't know how to receive mm -hmm. so that that's true. that's what that workbook is about and then the third mm -hmm. workbook is dragonflies unleashed and it is about having a vision it's for women who feel a yearning in their soul that they're called to do something, but they don't know how to find it. They don't know what it is. And so it's a workbook about how to kind of hone in on your vision and come up with some ideas of how you can take that vision and implement it. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of what I like to do. I love to do vision board workshops. Oh, yes. Is it sort of uh -huh. yes. like that? Yes. But a little, um, yes. I, I just do two or three of those every year just because mm -hmm. I think they're great. It's great for me to to gather people and do my own vision board. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it gives me incentive. So could you say your that third section has some of the qualities of a gathering yes. together and thinking yes. about uh, it yeah. does. It definitely does. It sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. It helps women figure out what is the thing that makes our heart sing? What is it that they would do if they never got paid for it like for you perhaps it's singing in the choir right. what is that thing you know mm -hmm. how can we bring that gift forward and then how mm -hmm. can you share it with the world right yeah well i like those now does have you been able to well maybe you need to describe this what is the incentive in prison to help a woman start uh 
a new life or turn their life around? Or is there a program? Do they try to do that? <coughs> In my experience, there was, I never saw that. There's okay. no programs to help you do that. Right. Uh, and they're critically needed. So I'm hoping that by getting some of these workbooks inside the prison that we can start making an impact there. Yeah. Um, it's a huge mountain to tackle. And we, you know, we we're just getting started, but um, women need that so desperately and they need to, you know, one of the things I found that was so hard is I was in prison for 27 months, which is a relatively short time in the yeah. world of prison sentences there are women who are in prison for a lot longer. And when you come out of prison, you know, you're kind of this time warp. You go into prison and you're at this point in your life and the world goes on without you. And you're kind of set in prison where the world doesn't really go on. And then you get out of prison and you think you're going to come back and you're just going to jump back into your life and fit right oh. back in where you left off. And that never happens oh, because yeah. the people in your life have moved on without yeah. you. Yeah. And so you need to um, you need to find your new place in the world, and that's a big adjustment. That's pretty difficult to do. Yeah, I would think that would be very difficult to do without yeah. some help. Without some an, help, do they do an after program to help people readjust into the community? No, they do no. not. No, and so I'm going to try to. Uh, talk to parole and probation officers, because if you get out of prison and you are on parole or probation, you have to meet with your probation officer for a period of time. And uh -huh. it seems to me that that could be the place where we could put in some of these programs that would really help rehabilitate women. Yeah. So can I assume that you have a almost a personal commitment to help the yes. women that are in prison? Absolutely. Yes, I do. That's my mission. Yes. Yeah. That's a great mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if these, your three core, you call them courses or? They're workbooks. And each workbook. of them are 12 weeks. They're designed to be a 12 week program, each one of them. Okay. So you can start one of those in a prison system and she could, every week she could work on something. Mm -hmm. That would, yes. and it's a lot of writing, I would assume. It's a lot of writing, yes. Yeah. A lot yeah. of writing and a lot of drawing because I think, you know, being oh, creative, drawing. drawing takes it opens a different part of your brain than the writing part. So I try to involve them all. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody doing that now? There you are. You're working with, I mean, you know, I had some prisons that I was lined up to work with, and one of them was going to. Uh, bring the workbooks in and then COVID hit. And so all of their programs shut down. So yeah. during the whole time, and a lot of prisons still, they still don't let the volunteers come in now. Um, there's just no, um, there's no, uh, nobody allowed inside the prison. So it's just been a really bad time. Uh, yeah. It's been cut down and everything. So um, we kind of got improving? stalled. Isn't that improving well, now? in some places it is, but in some prisons that's not. So I've oh, heard really? from someone in a prison in Arizona and they still have a bunch of regulations about uh, no physical contact during the visits and, you know, things like that. So it's, it's not completely back to where it was. I wonder, could, uh, do they do Zoom or would that be? No, they don't I have internet. Much... Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. They don't I have see. internet inside the prisons and the inmates don't have access to computers. Oh, yeah. And they don't have cell phones. So, yeah, oh, they don't yeah. do things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, really, I kind of believe that a program such as you have is much better in person because you never yes. know what's going to come up. That's true. Uh, so, well, I, I really do hope that you're able to get that going. Yes, we're working on it. We have a plan that we're getting ready to start. Once we got the book launched, um, that took a lot of our time in the last year, but now we're ready to focus back on the workbooks and get those programs out there. Yes. Yeah. So I have the programs in a couple of halfway houses, which is a place where a lot of inmates go yeah. when they get out of prison. So mm -hmm. that it's good, you know, we're having them in those programs, I think is good, but mm -hmm. uh, we need to reach more of them. Now, are they taught by somebody or can they totally do this independent? You could totally, I wrote the workbook so that you could work through them on your own. 
Okay. I've tried to give enough instruction and direction so that you could just do it on your own. And the three different uh, workbooks, do they come in any order? Well, you can get them in any order, but I always look at them as Butterflies Unleashed is the first one and Be Unleashed uh -huh. is the second and Dragonflies is the third. Okay. So, and, and I, you know, they're sold on my website. We're getting ready to uh, republish them and they'll be available on Amazon as well. Oh, uh, good. but for now they're available on my website and you can buy a set of all three or you can buy each book individually yeah <clears throat> how much is a set um Do you gosh, remember? it's Maybe somewhere I... around 67 dollars, i think for the set of three it's very reasonable mm -hmm. so we want them to go to your website for sure yes so which is toby door so my website is tobydoor.com and that's t-o-b-y D O R R. On my website, you can see links to all of my podcast appearances, my interviews, the essays I've written. Uh, my, you can see information about my memoir, about the workbook programs. You can read my blog. So everything you need to know is on that website. Yeah, very good. Yes. So, what would you say has been, if you don't mind, I like to ask this question of everybody. Okay. What has been the most important thing that you've discovered on this journey that you've been on? I think the most important thing I discovered is that I am enough. I am worthy. Mm -hmm. I am, I have value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you know most women suffer from I'm not enough? Yes, I do. I do. It's quite common. Mm-hmm. And we carry yeah. it a long time. We right. certainly do. Lifetimes even. Yeah. Well, I want to say this has been a <coughs> delight to have you here, Toby. I've learned a lot from your well, experience. You. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't want to repeat it, but. <laughs> I don't want to repeat it either. <laughs> <laughs> I would never repeat it. I mean, I but the woman I am now. today would not make the same choices that I made no, back then. No. But at the but, same time, I don't wish that out of my life either because it was so invaluable in the things that I learned and the woman that I become. It was a critical turning point. So I was blessed to have gone through it. Oh, but I know in reading this, I mean, you have been featured on Wall Street Journal, Anderson Cooper, Brooke Baldwin, Inside Edition, The Atlantic, and Dateline. And Dateline, that's you. correct. I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still out there. There's a link to it on my website, so you can oh. go watch it. Oh, mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> but you really have experienced some, um, I want to say, major changes in your life. Yes, I yes. Mean, you've opened doors to things you probably never thought you would be on. That's exactly right. I know exactly you had right. pinching yourself when you were sitting in front of Andrew Anderson Cooper. I was stunned at that. Yeah, it was. And that was, you know, that was early on. And I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> I, I guess I do need to be telling this story of if he wants to hear it, then the world needs to hear it. Well, it's such an unusual story. It, I mean, yes, it is. It really is unusual. So anyway, I am just thrilled that you chose to come on Second Wind. And I got the opportunity to spend some time with you. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on in your life and a lot of it's very good. Yes, so, thank you. And it's been yeah. delightful to meet you. I've really enjoyed our time. Good, good. Well, I'm going to speak to my audience just a few minutes. So okay. thank you. Thank you for being here. You're okay. welcome. I yeah. loved it. Thanks so much. Now, we have just, we've heard Toby's story. And you have such an opportunity to share this because there's somebody out there that you know that is facing shame, that's in a cage, not free to be herself. She may be calling herself a victim. And then she made a mistake. So it changed her life, but it doesn't have to change her life. So, you know, those are all pretty common experiences for most humans. Women are very susceptible to them. So I really encourage you to share this. You can either direct, send it directly to your friend that you are thinking of right now, 
or just share it for the one that you're not expecting to open your year forward. So anyway, as usual, I always ask you to do that and I appreciate so much that you're here this week. This week, I hope you'll have a great week. We've just come off 4th of July and we're feeling really super about the United States and how free we are here. So take this week, go to the website, which is tobydoor.com and look at the website. You might want to start one, one of those periodic those courses that she offers and just tip your toe into the lake of new learning and you'll love every minute of it there's so many other things on the website so please take time to do that thank you again it's always great to know you're out there listening and i look forward to next week when we have another guest bye joyce buford returns next week at the same time for another edition of second wind Through the Joyce Buford Empowerment System, women are receiving the support they need through their transitions and are able to reclaim their true purpose with confidence. They receive the tools they need to map out new lives. You can find out more about her coaching services at JoyceBufordEmpowers.com.